Hello everybody, I'm Gwen Campbell-Mendez. Welcome to Gwen's Bookish Ramblings. And so this is Robin McKinley's second novel of Beauty and the Beast. Uh, I did Beauty last week, and so this week we're doing Rose Daughter. And there, it's the same story, obviously. It's the same Beauty and the Beast story. There's a merchant, he loses everything. Uh, he and his daughters have to live in poverty. The father goes on a trip in order to try to recoup some of his losses. On his way back, he gets stumbles into the beast's home. The beast tells him, you have a choice. You can either stay here with me or you can trade one of your daughters for your freedom. He goes back. His daughter says, no, you're not. I'm not going to let you trade your freedom. Uh, I'm going to do it. And then she does it, and she lives with the Beast for a while, and tur turns him down when he repeatedly asks her to marry him, goes home for a while due to illness or something in the family, and then returns back to the Beast upon realizing she loves him, says she loves him, and everybody lives happily ever after-ish. That's the rough outline of the story. What's interesting is the differences between these two stories. Because the first novel, it's set with a much, much more modern tone. More than that, it's set, it's set in a world that is approximately our own. That you have the conversations with the Beast. I mentioned this last time, in which they're talking about the fact that the Beast has a library full of books which have not yet been written which is a very, very interesting concept. However, this one is different. And it, it obviously, I mean, they're, you're not going to just publish the same book twice and give it a different title and try to pretend it's something new. But what's interesting about this one is how very much more stylized it is. You know, in the first one, you have these sisters who are given names, you know, Grace and Honor and uh, whatever the third one was, but Honor, being the youngest, uh, doesn't really get the concept of Honor and says she would rather be Beauty, so they call her that. But in this one, the three daughters' names are very deliberately abstracted. They're names that are designed by an author to describe a character. Um, it is vaguely reminiscent of, say, Dickens when he names his characters things that are designed to, you know, create an idea of the character. In this case, the eldest daughter's name is Lionheart, and she is brash and loud and aggressive and unsubtle and, you know, is good with horses and in the end winds up pretending to be a young man in order to get a job further on down the story. The second one is called Jewel Tongue, and what she is is clever and witty and very, very, really sharp-tongued, in particular at the start of the book when they're all wealthy people living in palatial surroundings uh, and, you know, don't have to deal with the consequences of being jerks, in effect. And the youngest one, her proper name is Beauty. Um, but, so it's it's a very interesting thing, because Lionheart, I mean, you know, yes, of course, that is uh, Richard Plantagenet's, you know, nickname, the Coeur de Lion, the Lionheart. Um, but it's not his proper name, and it's not a name for a young woman, you know, even less so. And Jewel Tongue, again, it's these aren't proper names, not in the traditional Western idiom of, of how we name things, people rather. And so this, this whole novel takes on an ex a much more stylized appearance than the first one, which feels more like a straightforward story about real people uh, in a more or less real situation where there is some intersection with magic uh, but, but it's not, that one lacks the genuine sense of existing in a fairy story reality that, but 
this one, Rose Daughter, it, it firmly places itself in a fairy tale sort of reality with those names alone. Uh, so it, it's, it sharply contrasts in that way. The style of writing is, again, much more formal, much more restrained, uh, much less personal. The, the first novel is is a first-person perspective, whereas this one is an omniscient third person, mostly, uh, I mean, mostly from Beauty's perspective, uh, basically from Beauty's perspective, but it's, it, but it is third person. It's not I said, it is and Beauty said. Um, again, the, the, all of these little qualitative differences, they, they you know, they make a difference in just the atmosphere of the novel, you know, so that the details also do change. It, it, you know, you do have details that change in terms of the actual story. In the first one, it's, you know, when their father loses all their money, his future son-in-law uh, to his second daughter says, listen, I, you know, have this home that I was going to be setting up in, you know, out in the country, and why don't you all come with me? The house will be big enough. It will be tight, but it will be big enough for all of us, you know, to move in there together, and that's what they do. But here, here, Beauty finds a, a will, in effect, a letter saying that they had inherited a cottage from a woman from out in the hinterlands, and they decide that they're going to move out to the country because, well, they can't afford to keep their house anymore anyways, everything's been stripped, and so they head out to the house that was left them, but it turns out that it's a former witch's cottage, uh, and, you know, and it feeds into the whole of the story in a way that in a way that the house from that the house in the first novel does not that in this case the witch's cottage turns out to be the same the, the same you know good witch uh the, the home of the witch who had made sure that what happened to the beast was not as bad as it could have been that it, it, in this story, we don't have the beast being, you know, some kind of arrogant jerk who needs to be taught a lesson, but you instead have somebody who is a seeker of knowledge, and he gets in a little bit over his head. Uh, be and he winds up, in effect, bearding the gods in their own den, and in response, they change him into a beast, but it's sort of a response that is almost reflexive on their part because they're not sure what to do with somebody who is just there to learn, who is not there for any sort of ambition, who doesn't want to gain power or anything like that. But he winds up being changed into a beast, and the part of this where the enchantment on sort of his surroundings and his castle and all that stuff kicks in is where other sorcerers hear of his predicament and they come to see him because they want to get his advice to get the power that he had developed or wielded or what have you and some of them even want to be able to want to be turned into beasts because they want to be you know stronger and what have you and one of them effectively in a fit of pique then tries to trap the beast permanently in a sort of in this sort of a netherworld thing and the witch who was friends with the man that he had been before basically sort of flings herself in the path of the spell to divert it to create cracks in it to give the beast an opportunity to escape and anyway so beauty joins the beast and eventually, you know, they figure out how to escape, and one of the interesting things in this um, 
is also that at the end of this, unlike in a lot of other variants of this story, the beast does not become human again. Uh, Beauty is in fact given an option at the end of this that, you know, you can get everything that the beast was and get it all back and the two of you will be able to live happily ever after in this castle and so on. And it turns, and, you know, or you can bring him back with you and you'll just be, you know, the daughter of the local guy who does sums and sister to the woman working in the stables and the other one who does makes dresses. And Beauty asks a clever, a, a smart question about what the fallout would be for if she chose to, you know, have him become human again for them to have the castle. And it said that, you know, their names would be spoken and reviled throughout history because no matter what they would do, you can only see so far, and when you have that much power, sometimes you can accidentally misuse it or cause problems that you can't even realize. And so she chooses the humble life, but it means that the beast comes back as a beast. And so you're going to have this small village, which will now have a resident sort of non-human satient beast thingy with, you know, the fur and, and whatnot. And Beauty's sisters do basically accept him. They, you know, when he arrives back with Beauty and, and Jewel Tongue, who has become a dressmaker in the meantime, has, you know, says, wow, it's going to be a lot of trouble making you a wedding outfit for you know, just so quickly, she says, as she looks the beast over, like, they just, they just roll with it. Um, and it's that quality, this quality of acceptance of magic, of really treating magic, not just as, you know, something where we have, because the first one does discuss having, you know, witches in town and people who do small spells and so on, but in this one, it really, really feels very fundamentally like magic is just so much part of the fabric of their reality that, you know, the beast shows up and if everybody's assured that he's fine, then they're all fine and they just roll right with it. And it's, it's very, very interesting and a different, and as I said, it's a very different take as compared to the first one that she did. Uh, you know, there's characteristics of Robin McKinley and how she writes that are, are in this. I, you know, you can't deny that a writer will have a particular style as, as she does, as anyone does. But it's a very interesting, qualitatively different, different retelling. Um, Interestingly, also, she has an endnote uh, uh, for this about her inspiration in which she talks about how the first one that she did, Beauty, she hadn't, at first she hadn't even intended to really write the novel. It had basically just been done as an exercise to keep herself writing when she hit a period of writer's block, and she hadn't even necessarily expected it to be published, and then after it was, she had not intended to ever revisit this. It's her favorite fairy tale, but she hadn't intended to revisit it because, well, she'd written the novel. But then she got married and moved away, and the wrench of moving to a completely different country and all of the changes that came with it sort of drove her into writing this, this variant. So... It's an interesting book. It, it's an interesting second take, and it's an interesting inspiration, and it's it's worth the read almost in concert with the other, just just to compare and contrast. Um, and yeah, so that's just about my time, and I will see you all next week. <laughs>